Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord Jesus, we are in a crazy time where many of us feel uh, out of control of our own lives. We know that you are in ultimate control of this and that you are using it for your good. Even if you don't show us how your good is being done through this disease, we ask you to give us faith that that is what's happening. Faith that trusts in your promises and your word that you have passed over us and we therefore have passed from death to life. Amen. Well, good morning again, everyone. Thank you for tun tuning in to our, uh, our video here as we uh, do worship online, which is a little bit unique for all of us. I'll tell you that as a preacher, it's a little bit unique to just be staring at a camera instead of looking at your fine faces and getting visual feedback um, from you. So uh, it's a little bit of a challenge for me, but I appreciate your patience with me too as um, we go through this unique time in the world's history and the unique time in our church's history. Um, I, I'm imagining that as you sit home today, uh, if you've uh, continued to be human, if you've not ceased to be human, you're feeling a lot of emotions right now. Um, and I'm guessing that some of you are feeling the emotion of worry. You're worried about all sorts of things. You're worried about yourself or maybe somebody that you love who has a compromised immune system or maybe is elderly and their immune system can't handle a disease like COVID-19. Maybe some of you are worried about the economy. You're worried that because business has almost completely grinded to a halt that our economy isn't going to recover once this disease is through its um, strongest phase. Maybe some of you are just trying to figure out how to manage having kids home for a three week long March break or maybe longer. You're trying to figure out how to navigate your house with all these people in your house that you're not used to having around. Um, and maybe some of you are not really sure how to prepare for this thing at all and, and that's making you worried. You're going to the store and you're, you're thinking you should buy something but you don't really know what it is and, and so you end up buying, I don't know, 100 rolls of toilet paper and you just you buy it and you wonder to yourself, is this, is this what I'm supposed to do? And you drive home with a whole lot of anxiety in your heart. But I'm guessing not all of you are worried. I'm guessing some of you are angry. You're angry because you think this whole thing is kind of overblown. You look at the other super diseases that we've gone through as a society, or you look at even just the common flu, and you think to yourself, why is everyone making such a big deal of this? They're overblowing it. I'm sure that some of you are angry at all those people who go and buy 100 rolls of toilet paper because you just want maybe like five to get you through the week and you can't find any on any of the shelves. I'm sure some of you are angry. You're angry at the media for the way that they're handling the information that they're being given, that they're maybe using it to make a political party or a certain candidate or um, a certain uh, politician look bad. Or maybe they're just using this as a story to get more views. I'm sure some of you are angry at our government or other governments that they haven't been doing enough to curb the, uh, the spread of COVID-19 or flatten the curve, as many people are saying. Maybe you're just irritated at China uh, for not being upfront about what was happening in their nation and therefore bringing a whole bunch of pain on the rest of the world. On the other hand, I'm sure there are some of you who are thinking, I'm angry because people aren't taking this seriously. You look around at the people driving on the road or the many people who are still going to stores regularly and you wonder, are these people dumb? Do they not know what's going on around us? I bet a number of you are feeling anger right now. And I bet some of you are just feeling sadness. You had plans for March break. Uh, you were gonna go somewhere, maybe with your family or to go visit family. You're thinking right now of your summer plans and you're worried if they're even going to happen at all. Some of you are just sad because you look around the world and you see the suffering that people are going through, especially in areas like Wuhan or Italy or France. And you know that we have really good health care here in Canada and things seem to be okay, at least right now, but across the world, that is not the case. And you're just sad about it. There are a lot of emotional reactions to this disease and the way that it's spreading across the world. And I think that's because, at least for us in Canada, 
we've had a critical foundation shaken. See, the sermon of normalcy that's been preached to us every day for, in some cases, decades, has taught us that life is always going to be relatively the same. And nothing major is going to change about it. Uh, I think many of us have grown to sort of expect that as long as you do things the right way, you say the right words, don't break any laws, things will relatively work out for you. But COVID-19 is not allowing us to live that way. It is preaching to us loud and clear that it is possible to do everything right and to still get the wrong result. To wash your hands, to self-isolate, to be relatively clean about the way that you live, and to not be able to avoid this disease. Some of us are, are learning in a very, well, very blunt way that life is not going to continue the way that it always has. And that, frankly, we don't have as much control over the world as we thought we did. We like to think we have a lot of answers. We like to think we have a lot of control. But as we watch the TV and see even the health experts saying that these are probably the best practices, but we don't really know exactly what's going to happen with this disease, and we're confronted with the reality that we just don't have control over this world. So... <laughs> Here many of us are, sitting in social isolation, realizing that we don't have as much control over the world as we thought, wondering what's going to happen next, and, and frankly, I think it's producing a lot of anxiety in people's hearts. So what's the good news? What's the Christian response to a pandemic? Well, there are two pieces of good news. Um, the first of those is that this is not the church's first pandemic. Uh, maybe if you watched the six videos that I posted on our YouTube channel this week, the last video, which posted yesterday, uh, talks about how the church has responded in the third century and the Middle Ages to a couple of epidemics that um, brought disease on the world. The church has actually historically done really well in the face of mass disease and epidemic. So, as Christians, we should understand we're going to be just fine. In fact, if anything, the disease gives us the chance to live a more obvious Christian life. Now, I don't want to go very deep into that because I did six videos on it this week, and you can go watch those. In fact, I would encourage you, as soon as you're done with worship today, to stay right on our YouTube channel and go to those six videos and watch them if you haven't already watched them. Uh, but since this is worship... I want to focus a little bit more on God than on what we do as Christians. And the other part of the good news is that this isn't God's first pandemic. Um, obviously, God has led his people through many epidemics and pandemics in the past. Um, but specifically, we want, we want to focus on one story today that is not actually a case of mass disease, but it is a case of mass death. And we want to show how God brought his people through that situation and how it became a picture of the greatest good that God has ever done for his people. The story that we're going to read comes from Exodus 11 and 12, um, and it's kind of a long section, so bear with me as I read it. Um, if you'd like to, it might be a good chance for you to pause the video and pull out your actual paper Bible and turn to Exodus 11 and 12, or you can just follow along on the screen behind me. Um, just to give you a little bit of context for this story before I read it, uh, this is the story or the end of the story of the, the 10 plagues of Egypt. Um, Israel, God's people, have been enslaved for almost 400 years in, is in uh, Egypt, and this is the end of that time. And so Moses has brought nine plagues on uh, Pharaoh and Egypt because Pharaoh will not let the people go. And so now Moses is announcing to Pharaoh the 10th and final plague. So that's where we pick up the story from uh, Exodus chapter 11. So Moses said, this is what the Lord says. About midnight, I will go through Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who is at her hand mill and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be loud wailing throughout Egypt worse than has ever been or ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any person or animal. 
Then you will know that the Lord made, makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these officials of yours will come to me, bowing down before me and saying, Go, you and all the people who follow you. After that, I will leave. Then Moses, hot with anger, left Pharaoh. The Lord had said to Moses, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you so that my wonders may be multiplied in Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go out of his country. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, each from his house, for his household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood in the basin, and put some on the, of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway. He will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. This is God's word. I know that uh, pretty much all of you have been in some form of quarantine or social distancing for the last couple days or maybe, maybe even over a week. And I know actually some of you are just starting your quarantine or social distancing because you've just come back from being overseas. And I bet that if you've been in quarantine or social distancing for any length of time, you're starting to get a little bit stir crazy. Um, as social beings that God created to live in community, it's really hard for us to be separate. Um, it can be almost a, a struggle internally for us to just get up and sort of have a purpose for the day if we don't have other people that we're going to see. But if you think that's uncomfortable, then think about 400 years. 
400 years was how long Israel had been enslaved in Egypt. From about 1900 BC to about 1500 BC, Israel was doing all of Egypt's dirty work. Now recently, it has started to get actually kind of worse because there was this guy named Moses who was messing with the Pharaoh. Uh, Moses had this command from God that he was supposed to go to the Pharaoh and tell the Pharaoh to let his people go. And while it was nice that that, uh, Moses came along with some plagues to make the uh, Egyptians uncomfortable, things like the Nile turning to blood or an infestation of locusts or frogs or darkness or boils on the skin of the Egyptians, it was actually making life for the Israelites worse. Uh, Pharaoh was sort of tightening the noose, if you will, making the work harder, giving them less resources to accomplish the work that they were supposed to do, and so Israel was getting frustrated. And so God tells Moses, okay, this is it. I'm going to end this thing. And even though Pharaoh's not going to listen, I'm going to bring a punishment on him that will leave him no choice but to let you go. And that punishment you heard in the text is the plague of the firstborn. The firstborn son in every family, including even the cattle, was going to die overnight. Now, God had provided a way to get out of this for the nation of Israel because he knew Pharaoh wasn't going to listen. So he gave the command to Moses to tell the elders of the nation who would pass it on to every person in the city that uh, they should take a lamb, they should kill that lamb, take the blood, paint it on the door frames of their house, eat the entire animal along with some bread and herbs and drink wine along with it. And then they were supposed to wait Wait for the Passover. Wait in traveling clothes, ready to go, because as soon as the Lord passed over, it would be time to leave. And that's where the Old Testament Christians got the festival of the Passover. So what does this mean for us as we live in the 21st century and uh, as we work through uh, COVID-19? Well, before we get into what this means for us, I think we have to go after a couple questions that the skeptic will naturally have. The first of those is, why is God killing people at all? Doesn't that seem like a sort of capricious tyrant God who just takes lives from whoever he wants to take it from just to make himself feel better or his people feel better? Well, in order to understand uh, what God means and what he's doing uh, through this plague, you have to understand sin as debt. There are a lot of ways to understand sin, and the Bible talks about it in a number of different ways, but for our purposes today, you need to understand sin as debt. Maybe I can explain it to you like this. Um, Let's imagine that you have a criminal on trial, and he's done something terrible, fill in the blank of whatever you think he did. And uh, he says to the judge, you know, judge, I'm, I'm really sorry for what I did. So the judge says, okay, if you're really sorry, then you can go free. Like no one would be okay with that, right? Because that would be, we would call it unjust, right? Uh, injustice. But the reason that we think it's unjust is because we realize that there is a debt that goes along with sin. See, if, if that man goes free, then someone has to pay the debt, whether it's maybe murder that he committed. That person who died, their their life is paid, right? They paid with their life for this man to do something evil. Or maybe it's a sexual sin like rape. That woman's dignity is taken from her. She has to live with that debt if he goes free. We understand that sin, evil, requires a repayment. And God works exactly like this. He says that there is a repayment that needs to be made for the evil that we do. And specifically, he says that that repayment is death. Uh, The wages of sin is death, is what the Bible says. But sometimes people wonder, especially modern people like us, do I really have a debt with God? Because we look at our lives and say, well, I'm not a murderer or I'm not a rapist, so why do I have a debt to God? I mean, I've done maybe some bad things in my life, but nothing that warrants my death. Well, let's see if I can get you around this idea uh, with this example. Let's say you had a, uh, a tape recorder that hung around your neck, and it recorded every time that you put a standard of behavior on another person. 
So anytime you said, you should have, or they should have, or you ought to, to another person, it recorded that standard. And at the end of your life, your life and your actions were compared to the standard that you put on other people. How would you do? I think the majority of us realize that even against our own standard that we set up for ourselves, we aren't living up. There is a debt that needs to be paid because we are not doing what is good all the time. So now maximize this because God's standard is not just good enough, but perfection. God has every right to take the lives of the sinful people that are on this world. And that includes you and me. Even if you think of yourself as not that bad of a person, you have a sin debt to God. And someone's going to have to pay. And so God has every right to take payment for the sin that we have committed against him. But what's the deal with the firstborn? Why does he say the debt that I'm going to take is the life of your firstborn? Well, to understand this, I think we need to get outside of our North American, uh, Western world, individualistic culture for a little while and understand the idea of collectiveness in the family. We like to think as North Americans that every person kind of makes their own way and does their own thing, is their own person, and their family doesn't determine who they are. Um, But we really actually figure out that this is not true. Because you can just look at your lifestyle and the way that you live and compare it to your parents' lifestyle, and I bet you'll find a lot of similarities already, even if you don't particularly like those things. But let's take this a step further and think about how many people of us would say family is the most important thing in life. Even though most of us don't actually functionally live that way, like we would think I'm the most important person in life is frankly how most of us live. Or maybe my friends or these people who I like, they're more important than my family. A lot of us would say family is most important. And that's because deep down inside, programmed into the way that we are, God has set us up to understand that family is part of us. You could just prove this scientifically. You are your parents. You are a piece of your mother and a piece of your father that broke off from their body and combined to make you a new human with unique genetic code, yes, but made from the material of your parents. There's a reason that when you look at your kids, you love your kids more than you love my kids because they are you in a way. And your brothers and sisters, they are variations of your parents combining together. They're variations of you. Our family is who we are. And so if we understand life in that way, a little bit different than we're used to as North Americans, we can start to understand why God said that he would take the life of the firstborn. Because the firstborn son of the family would be sort of like the stern of the ship, uh, the thing that was going out in front of the rest of the family, because the firstborn son was, first of all, male and was going to carry on the family name. Second of all, was the oldest, but the youngest of the children, so that he would be the first to grow up to adulthood, but would still be the first of the next generation. So he would carry on the family that way. And in their culture, the firstborn was the one who carried out or got the inheritance from his father. And so he would have the means in order to provide for the rest of his family. In that way, the firstborn was kind of the the front man of the family moving forward. So God in his mercy says, look, every person in your family has a sin debt to me. But to have mercy on you, I'm going to transfer that sin debt to the firstborn son of your family. Now, this plays out in Exodus 13 and a couple other places in the Bible where God says, this is how I'm going to move forward with you. Your firstborn son belongs to me until you buy it back. So you're going to have to actually pay an offering price to get your firstborn son back from me because you owe him to me. So when God calls the firstborn and says, this is the one that I'm going to take as my angel of death comes through, And God is actually not being unjust or capricious or a tyrant. He is actually just calling in the debt, the thing that he already is owed. So what does this have to do with COVID-19? Well, I think the first thing that we have to understand is that we all have a sin debt to God that needs to be repaid. Now, the beautiful thing that God has done is he has, in a sense, transferred that sin debt. Uh, We're going to talk about how he moves that sin debt onto Jesus later in the sermon. 
But for now, we all have to come to grips with the reality that we do owe a sin debt to God, and it's going to be paid with our physical life here on earth. Every one of us is going to die. Whether it's COVID-19 that takes our life or a freak accident or you die because your body wears out, every one of us is going to die. The sinfulness that every one of us has, whether we're a good person or a bad person, means our life is going to end and that God has the right to take that life from us whenever he wants. And if we don't have that level of humility to understand that we are just as able to be killed by this disease as everyone else, we won't be able to fully understand the gospel that God is going to show um, through the Passover and through the, the um, fulfillment of the Passover that we're going to find out later in the sermon. Maybe to show you how this plays out uh, on, on the ground right now, I'm seeing a lot of things as I scroll through Facebook and, and news feeds, Twitter, that sort of thing. I'm seeing a lot of things from Christians that essentially say, God is going to take care of us. God is going to protect us. We have nothing to worry about. And while that's not outright wrong, we read in Psalm 91, definitely God is sending his angels concerning us to guard us in all our ways. I think it sort of reduces God to the level of a good luck charm for, children, for Christians. Like Christians sort of think of God as their um, multi-tool that they hold on next to them. In any situation, God's got an answer for this so that I can figure it out and I can keep on going. God's like their assistant, their sidekick who fixes things for them, but really they're the protagonist of the story. They're the one who conquers. They're the one who's victorious. And if I can just be really blunt with you, that's not Christianity. That's what some religious scholars call moral therapeutic deism. It's essentially, if I'm a good person and do what God says, God is going to take care of me and make my life okay. But that is simply not what the Bible says. Did you notice that uh, God does make a distinction between Israel and Egypt, but he still says you have to do this number of things in order that the angel of death will pass over you. In other words, the angel of death is coming for every single one of them. It's coming for the Egyptian. It's coming for the Israelite. God even says to the Israelites, don't go out of your house. Because if you're outside of your house, when the angel of death comes, you will be taken. Because you're not underneath the covenant that I'm making with you. And Christians need to understand this. If we are going to be helpful to the culture and not seen as those who are insensitive and uncompassionate to the people who are struggling with this disease, we have to get over the idea that Christians are going to somehow come out of this thing better than everybody else. That is simply not true. Uh, this is a huge point, and obviously you don't have bulletins with you, but I really want to make it as clear as possible for you. God does not promise to protect us from a pandemic. He promises to protect us through a pandemic. In other words, in the same way that the angel of death came on Egypt, and God didn't say, the angel of death is not coming after you, Israelites. No, God said, the angel of death is coming for everybody. But I am making a way for you to get through this, right? To come out the other side. And that's what God is showing us also. Uh, COVID-19, like the angel of death, is no respecter of persons. It is coming for every single person, regardless of whether you are Christian or not. So the answer is not hoping that God is going to exempt you from the danger of this world, but understanding that God is making a way for you to get through it that you may not immediately notice. But you're not going to notice it unless you are first willing to realize that you are not in control of your life. Uh, like I said, many of us are starting to feel this, that we can try to do all the right things, but the right things don't seem to happen to us. That's right where God wants you, because he wants you to understand that this is his narrative. He is the protagonist, and we are the ones who trust in him as he does what is good for humanity and good for us. So let's look at his salvation plan for the Israelites as, as the uh, angel of death comes on Egypt. Um, if you're taking notes, this would be a good thing to write down. God saved Israel through the death of the lamb. Um, God says, take a lamb, kill the lamb, roast the lamb, and eat the lamb with bread and wine, and eat it while you're wearing your traveling clothes, and then take the blood and paint it on your door frames. Well, what is God saying? God is saying, I claim the life of your firstborn, but I will accept the death of a firstborn male lamb without defect, in its place. 
So the Israelites who followed God's command received protection. And you can imagine that moment as, I don't know if the windows shuttered or there was wind or there was some sort of noise as the angel of death came past, as the Israelites looked at their son and they looked at the lamb and they realized that they had no control over the situation, but just trust that God had said that this lamb's death would make up for the death that he had claimed on their firstborn son. That's the situation they were in. But of course, as you found out in the text, God was made good on his promise and not a death was found in the nation of Israel. But that draws our attention to what that means for us today, which comes through when Jesus fulfills the Passover. Do you remember this story? It's the night before Jesus is going to be betrayed and it's the day before Jesus is going to be crucified. And Jesus is with his disciples celebrating the Passover. As they have the Passover meal together, Jesus takes the position of the father, the head of the household, who is supposed to have sort of a narrative that he tells about the meal as they go. And he stands up to speak, but some things are different. First of all, he doesn't recite the normal narrative that that the father of the house was supposed to say over the Passover meal. Instead, he says, take and eat. This bread is my body. And then he takes a cup and says, take and drink. This blood is, uh, this um, wine is the blood, it's my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you. So he flips the script a little bit. And then as he's standing, the disciples, I'm sure, realize the one thing that was missing from the Passover meal. The lamb. Right? There was bread without yeast and there was wine to drink, but there was no lamb on the table. Why wasn't the lamb there? Well, because the lamb was not on the table, the lamb was at the table. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In Revelation, when the Apostle John saw a vision of Jesus Christ, he saw him looking as a lamb who was slain. Jesus was very clearly saying, Passover is fulfilled in me. Because in the same way that you have killed lamb after lamb after lamb, as a picture of your sin not killing you, I am ultimately going to give my life so that your sin will never be accounted to you. And as Jesus went to the cross the next day, he paid that price. He was the firstborn without defect who was killed in a place of, well, everyone. And so when we receive the Lord's Supper, we receive the Lamb. Through the Lamb, excuse me, we receive that Lamb through Holy Communion. Jesus' body and blood, the the meat of the lamb, if you will, is contained in, with, and under the bread and the wine. So that as we eat the fulfillment of the Passover, we are connected to the lamb who was slain in our place for our sins. Now let me be very clear. Taking the Lord's Supper doesn't mean you're not going to get COVID-19. And it doesn't mean that you're going to live this side of heaven forever. But what it does mean is that the angel of eternal death has passed over you. That should you die this si- this, from this disease, you will not stay dead. You will not go to hell. You will go to heaven to be with Jesus. You will wake up in a place far better than this place. Everything will be right. Because God has passed over you. Now as Christians... This is a message we need to hear weekly. Because if it's not COVID-19, it's something else. It's something else that is threatening our livelihood or our happiness or maybe even our real life. It's a disease. It's a divorce. It's financial troubles. It's, it's whatever is going on in our life. We need to remember this. That because Jesus has bound his immortality to us, our mortality can live forever. God has passed over us. So what does this mean as we live our lives now going through this COVID-19 virus? Well, I think we should look at the text one more time and look for a few clues as to how we are to live. Uh, If you want to write down some next steps, here's what I think this text teaches us to do. First of all, to paint our door frames. You can imagine in the, the ghettos of Egypt, as the Israelites were getting ready for that Passover night, 
things looked a little weird and they smelled a little weird. As the blood of animals was being painted on door frames, as people looked around, life looked a little weird and it probably smelled a little weird. Does your life look weird? I mean, does it look different than the rest of the world around you? As you go through COVID-19, do you look different? Do the things that you post on Facebook or the things that you talk about when you're having that uh, FaceTime conversation with your family or the topics of conversation in your house as you're all together at home, do they show that you're living differently? Do you smell different? Uh, could people who are close to you get the feeling that you don't worry about this disease like they do? I hope that they do. And the way that you're going to get that is by going back to the lamb who was slain. Knowing that this thing, this disease, and anything that comes after it, they're not worth fearing. You have the promise that whatever takes your life, it will just be the handmaiden who brings you into the presence of your God. It will be the hand that grabs you and pulls you out of this world into a life that is so much better. So paint your door frames. Live differently. Show the world that you have no fear of this disease because you have the promise that you have been passed over by eternal death. Second, put on your traveling clothes. Um, in the text, the Bible says that we are, they were supposed to put on uh, clothes that they would wear for a long journey, tuck their tunic into their belt and hold their walking stick with them because they were supposed to go as soon as God saved them. I think it is important for us as Christians to remember that we have the same command. Because God has saved us, because God has passed over us through the blood of the Lamb, we are called to go. We're called to go, first of all, to share the message of the good news that people can be passed over through faith in Jesus, but also that we use our hands and our feet to serve the people around us. Now, in self-isolation, I'm not exactly sure what that looks like for you, but I know that just because you're not with people physically, you cannot, that does not mean that you cannot support them emotionally or verbally. It's a text message, it's an email, it's a post on Facebook, it's a phone call, it's FaceTime, it's something that reaches out to the people who need you right now. And if it gets worse in this country, where our medical system can't handle all the patients, that they need nursing and we don't have professional nurses to provide that nursing, Let's be the first people to put on our traveling clothes and get out there and serve them. Because Christians have no fear of death. They know that death can't hold them because they have been passed over by the angel of eternal death. And finally then, live like you got nothing to lose. Fear is a paralyzing thing. And Satan loves fear. But the Bible tells us that perfect love drives out fear. The perfect love of God Almighty who put his son on a cross so that you would not have to die. So that, the, that the, the diseases of this world, the pandemics of this world, the terrible things that happen could be small in comparison to what God was willing to go through for you. Live like you got nothing to lose. Now I realize that since this is going on the internet, there may be some people who they are not really buying God, they're not really sure about Christianity, and they hear this whole message of, of God as the passing over, the eternal um, angel of death, and the whole thing, and they think well, that sort of sounds like a nice platitude to make people feel better during a time of crisis. I want you to look at the cross. I want you to remember that God was willing to go through something far worse than a pandemic for us that God's religion, Christianity, is not one of us do for God, but God does for us. He gets on the cross, takes the suffering on our place so that we can go free, so we can be passed over. And then finally, as Christians, I want us to remember that this thing is not the first time God has brought calamity on the world, but that we have an opportunity to show the faith that we have in our actions and our words. And I hope that years from now, maybe even centuries from now, there are historians who write about the Christians of the 21st century and show how they stood strong and held on to their faith. And the world was changed because of it. I pray that for all of us. I pray that for you. And if you'd let me, I would like to go to God in prayer right now. Lord Jesus, you have given us the opportunity to be lights in the darkness during this dark time. 
I pray that through our words and our actions, you make us those lights in the darkness so that people can know that you are good and you are kind, that you are loving, and that ultimately you are self-sacrificial, that you were willing to give even your own life for people. Give us hope through this pandemic. Give us opportunities to serve and give us peace that goes beyond understanding. Amen.